How's everybody doing? You are witnessing a holy moment here because my wife Jane has joined me on the platform tonight to answer your Red Hot questions. <clears throat> and uh, so this is, uh, this is awesome because she has so much wisdom and uh, so much experience that we have together, obviously, in uh, being married for almost 28 years. So we're gonna do the best that we can to kind of share out of our experience from that in response to your questions, as well as parenting. And so, uh, Jane, uh, all, all of our kids, we have three kids, and they are all grown and out of the house. Well, Tiffany is kind of a boomerang. She goes to college and then comes back and goes to college and comes back. Uh, but they're all grown, and uh, I just want to give all the credit that uh, Jane is the reason why our kids are well-balanced and healthy and alive today because of uh, her. So, awesome mom. So tonight, uh, for Red Hot, we're going to be answering questions from both Portage. So Portage, uh, you guys don't, uh, don't sit back, ask your questions. Those are online and here at Richland Campus as well. We're going to be taking your questions uh, on the subject of family and on parenting. So anything that kind of wraps up around marriage, family, parenting uh, is, is game tonight. And so if you haven't asked a question, you can go to radiant.church slash red hot and uh, we're gonna take questions tonight and at both of our services tomorrow and uh, looking forward to it, so. And I told Lee that if the questions were all like last week, I was only going to do tonight, so. So. <laughs> so be nice. Ask nice questions. She, if you want me back up here tomorrow, you got to have nice questions. Yeah. She so. agreed to do this before last week, and then when she heard all the questions, she's like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I said, I already announced it, so you have to do it. So, so tonight is for sure. We'll see what tomorrow holds. But um, we're going to go ahead and, and jump right in and take some of the questions. So here we go. This is from... John Z, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> is it true that in high school you and Jane once had a science class together and on the first day you said to her, uh, sat by her and whispered, it looks like we have chemistry together? No. <laughs> Next question. Okay. Thanks for playing, John. Uh, this is Kay from online. If you are married and you are further along spiritually than your husband, how do you let him be the, quote, head of the house or spiritual leader? That's a great question. Um, I think what is important is to understand it's not so much about letting him be the spiritual head of the house. Uh, it's, it's something that whether he wants that or not, it's part of what, how God has designed marriage and a responsibility that is on the husband. Uh, as the father, as the husband, that he is the head. And when you, if you were to study headship in the New Testament, because a lot of times in our culture when we use words like head, we think it's like domination, but that's not at all what it means. The word head actually means responsibility. He carries the responsibility, which means he's not just the one who gets to make the calls, he's the one that's going to be accountable. And so uh, you're not letting him be the head uh, because there's only one head. He is the head, which means he's the one who is responsible for that. But there is some things that I think in marriage are really important that uh, wives uh, and husbands really understand about each other. And in Peter, it talks about uh, so much that it talks about uh, different roles. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, in other words, they're not a disciple of Jesus, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respect and pure conduct. So I think what's important to understand is your attitude as a wife. So he, he may be a Christian and just not as far along spiritually mature as you are or maybe not as overtly uh, demonstrative in his faith or in his personality uh, he's still the, the one responsible over the, the household. Your responsibility is how you respond to him. And I would say that the number one thing that you can do uh, to bring peace in the household and how you, quote, allow him to be the spiritual leader is speak words of encouragement and words of honor to him. Uh, instead of 
uh, telling him all the things that he's not instead of telling him all the things that you wish he would do differently or I wish you would, you know, stay the Bible with me. I wish uh, you would read the Bible more. I wish you'd go to church more often with me. Uh, very few times in the history of humanity is a man going to respond, yeah, I'm a terrible person and you're right, let me do exactly what you want me to do. But a man is designed to respond to words of encouragement. And, and, so I, if, and I feel like so many times that women who feel like maybe they're more spiritually ahead of their husbands don't ever give their husbands time to lead or time to show even where they are spiritually because like what Lee was saying, some of them are more quiet or insecure in that and, yeah. and or afraid that like they're going to be... Um, you know, their wives maybe will come down hard on them. Right. And so just to Well, they feel embarrassed. Them, right, yeah. exactly. There's a lot of guys who are like, well, I don't know the Bible as well as you. You know, you go to Bible studies or you do this. I haven't done that. There's a little bit of an intimidation factor. But if you encourage them, it's like if he comes to church with you, it's like, speak a word or write him a little note. Thank you for going to church with me. Or you know what? The sexiest thing that you do is hold my hand in worship. That, I mean, you, you tell a guy that, he'll be at church every Sunday <laughs> holding your hand. Uh, you know what? When I, when I see you reading the Bible or when you, when you pray with us, uh, go ahead. And I think sometimes our expectations can be so high. Like, we have to pray every night. We have to read through the Bible. We have to... And I mean, obviously, all that is awesome, but there also is that thing of he has his personal relationship with the Lord. I have my personal relationship with the Lord. We don't pray together every night. You know what I mean? We try, we probably do a couple nights a week, um, a lot of the times in the morning for our kids, but nothing, you know, like Super deep. deep. And You're so giving I think away sometimes, all our secrets, Jane. Jeez. I know. <laughs> but I do, I've met with women who are like, you know, I just wish my husband would want to pray with me. And then, uh, and it's just like, yeah. it, that sometimes just isn't reality. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe true. I'm wrong. But, no, you're right. So. Praise God, you're right. And, <laughs> but, and you can also speak to the things that he is. They don't have to be spiritual. It's like, I love how you provide for our family. When you show honor to uh, your husband, he's, he's going to grow. He's going to flourish. But if you make him feel guilty... He's going to shrink, and he's going to avoid. Let me just tell you something about guys in general. We avoid environments that we're not confident in ourselves in. And so I'm, I'm not confident at fixing things. So if you had a barn raising, don't call me because I'm not showing up. I'm not going to come over there. Uh, if you have a theology discussion, I'll probably show up. That's things that I'm confident in. So speak words of confidence uh, because there's, there's power in the words of a wife. I really believe that. And if you'll do that, it's amazing how you can actually strengthen and build your husband up, okay? Let's take another question. This is from Susanna in Richland. Which comes first if you are a spouse and a parent? Parenting or your marriage? Ha, I love this question. It's a great question. Uh, here's what you need to understand. A family... The, the root of a family is one man and one woman in covenant that create a family. That is a family. Out of that family, children are born, but children do not stay. The goal of parenting is to train children up to reproduce. And I'm not just talking about having physical children. I'm talking about reproducing the faith and a relationship with God that you have that is the nucleus of a family. And so our job in raising our kids, we loved our kids, but you know what? They're only little for so long. And then they're teenagers, and then they're ag adults. And if you put all of your focus on the kids and you don't make your marriage first, your marriage is going to be until death do you part. But your children, it's going to be until you graduate do you depart. <laughs> your children, the goal is not for them to be 40 years old and still living in a basement saying, but I love mom. I don't want to leave. Mom, I'm mom's favorite, and so I want to live here for the rest of my life. It's, that's inordinate. And so you want to know what comes first. The marriage has to come first. So we would actually tell our kids, it's like, I love you, but you know what? I'm, I love your mom first, and I love her more in, in that way, that we're committed to one another. You're not going to drive a wedge between us. Um, I'm committed to your mom. We're going to have date day. We're going to have date time together. And there's going to be times where we have discussions that you're not invited into. It's because we have a relationship. 
because your family obviously is only as strong as your marriage is. But I remember Lee always, when he would tuck the kids down and we'd pray for them, would be like, I love God first, I love your mom, and then I love you kids. Yeah. And I just think that's so healthy because that's yeah. really the truth. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then when I would ask my kids, who, who do I love before you? And they would say, you love mom. <laughs> and I would say, that's right. And that's gross. And it's like, yeah, you'll get it when you get older. <laughs> and so absolutely. And here's the problem. When we have parent-centered homes, we raise self-centered kids. And we don't want to raise self-centered kids because self-centered kids do not grow up to be good husbands and good wives because marriage is not about self-centeredness, it's about self-sacrifice. So the greatest gift that you can give to your kids is demonstrating self-sacrifice in your marriage relationship, making that first, God first, God's the center, and everything flows out of that, and your marriage has gotta be the priority. So you've gotta prioritize date, dating, uh, you, you've got to, you know, guys, put deodorant on and take your wives out for dinner. Ladies, get rid of the sweats and put some outfit on and some war paint and go and have a great date day. All right, there you go. I'll get all kinds of emails for that one, but it's okay. Here we go. <laughs> Hannah from Richland, the Bible says, to be fruitful and multiply. I am married woman and I love children, but I don't feel the call on my life to have children. Am I disobeying what God has called us to do? Well, I think there may, that's a, that's a complex question. And if I were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, I would wanna know more about that because I could give you a, a simple answer and it probably is not going to really answer the issue that's going on. I would ask the question, why don't you wanna have children? And there may be legitimate reasons why you don't wanna have children. There are people that would like to have children, can't have children. Does that mean that they're being disobedient to God or that, a curse is on their life. Well, absolutely not. And there are people that don't want to have children, and uh, sometimes those are for good reasons, and sometimes they're for not so great reasons. One of the, so if I'm just talking in generalities, uh, one of the purposes of marriage, if you read Genesis and you read Malachi, is so that God would have a righteous seed in the earth. Children and fruitfulness is supposed to be part of marriage. Now, if there are, some people don't want to have kids because they have genetic things and they don't want to pass that on. Other people have experienced pain in their childhood and they're afraid of the kind of parent they'll be or they're afraid of uh, they're having the same type of experiences with their kids. Most of the time when somebody says, I don't want to have children, I want to be married, but I don't want to have children. Now, I'm saying this in generalities. It's because there is pain in their past. A lot of times it's because there is pain in their past or uh, they've got some professional thing that is going on. It may be a season that they're in right now and they say, well, I don't wanna have children now, maybe a little bit later. Uh, it, sometimes it has to do with present pain, that they might be married to somebody, that they're not confident that if we have children, I don't, I'm not sure that they're gonna be around. There are all kinds of issues around that. Here's what I would say. I would say that before you say that you don't wanna have children, ask God the question, do you want me to have children? See, part of the greatness of our relationship with God is we can say, uh, okay, God, what's your plans for me? And I'm not saying that in a super spiritual way, but it's so easy for us to tell God what we want. Sometimes we just need to stop and say, God, what do you want for my life? Uh, and I don't think that there's easy answers uh, to this particular type of question. So before I just put a dot on it, I would say that I think that maybe that is something you ask God. Maybe that's something you sit down with some people that you trust and process the why of it. Maybe you have a really good reason for why that you don't want that. And you know what? That's up to you and that's up to God. Uh, nobody can make judgments about that. Uh, but I think at the end of the day though, we need to be careful that we're not just living in the moment and living for ourselves because I've seen so many uh, people that then get down the road and say, you know what, I wish I had had kids. I wish I had done that. Jane and I, we had three and at 28, she's like, uh, you're going to get fixed. Uh, because we're too good at this. And, uh, and so I went, I, I, I went to see the doc. Guys, uh, Dr. Threw is all right. And so I went and saw Dr. Threw because we were through. And, uh, and then years later, though, it was like, I wish we had had one more. I wish we had had one more. So, you know, uh, be, be careful what you think you want and always take it before the Lord. Get wisdom from others and really pray through that.
Anything you want to say on that? Nope, you're smart. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is Kay from Richland. Jane, what advice do you have for those of us in the trenches of motherhood with the littles? How did you grow your relationship with the Lord when your children were little and everything was so busy and chaotic? That's a great question. That is a great question. Lee and I took a walk this morning. We're talking about that. Um, so literally, your children grow up so fast. And I know people tell you that. And I remember people telling me that. And I roll my eyes and be like, oh, I don't believe you. You know what I mean? And now I'm like, oh my gosh, Ashley's 26 and Jared's 20, almost 25 and Tiffany's almost 22 next week. And I'm like, how, and I have a grandbaby. I'm like, how did this happen? It does, it goes so fast. So just to say that, that it does go so fast. So enjoy every moment because I know it's hard. I mean, I was a stay-at-home mom. Lee was busy. We were starting the church. There are days I would be like, we had the little beep phones, and I'd beep them, and he'd be at a lunch, but I Next wouldn't know tell. it. And I didn't really know how to work the phone, and he'd be like, I'm at a lunch. And I'd beep him like, when are you coming home? Oh my gosh, the kids are driving me crazy. Um, and he'd be like, okay, I, I gotta call you back. But um, well, so hold on. just. I would get this beep, I'm in the middle of a meeting, and it would go, beep, beep, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I'm in a meeting, beep, beep, I'm in a meeting. And in the background, I hear, wah, wah, wah. she's like, beep, beep, get home. <laughs> so, anyways. And then, just to throw Jared under the bus, because he's not here, but he literally was so hard. He was so hard. And I remember at two, two, him, Lee coming home from work, and I'm like, I don't think we can do ministry. I think we're disqualified. <laughs> he's so naughty, like... I just don't think that we're called to do this. We can't. And he's like, oh, my gosh, Shane. Yeah. We can. We're, we're supposed to do this. Yeah. Like, he's two. We can, we can get through this. So, um, so just remember that. And then I literally made myself get up in the morning and just have, like, a half an hour with the Lord. Like, I'd have the coffee set, and I would get up at, I think it was, like, 5.30, and... I was tired, but I literally most days, and now I'm like, shoot, why aren't I doing that? But um, would get up and just have that time with the Lord, and I would journal, and um, and so there is ways to do it, like when the kids nap, um, get up early, stay up a little bit later, which I didn't want to do, and it, and I think in our minds that we think that it has to be something that's so great and so profound, and it. Mm -hmm. It's hours long, and God has just you know, opened the heavens and spoke to us, and it doesn't. You know what I mean? It's just that consistency of being in the Word, of, um, of worship. I mean, I'd always have, like, Jason Upton going on in the background or whatever, and just that consistency, and then you just grow in it. And, yeah. and I mean, I, I really feel like most days I got up and I did that. And it was nice for me because it was time by myself. Right. And, um, yeah, I didn't yeah. do that. So, no. I would wake up and she was already on the couch, had already prayed, was reading her Bible and had coffee. And Showered. I would get up and she had that moment so that when the kids got up, she was ready to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always admired that because, you know, I didn't want to get up that early. I was like, I'll get up at 6.30 or whatever, and she had already been up. But she, you know, like you said, it wasn't always like two, three hours, but she had always been up for maybe a half an hour. I mean, just even if I just herself. got the proverb of the day in, I was yeah. happy. And yeah. so I just want to say to you moms, just like, don't put so much pressure on yourself. Yeah. And then through the day, I literally always had worship music going on in the always. house. And um, our house and all the time. We had a so computer in the us. kitchen, mm -hmm. and uh, it had iTunes on there when that first came out, and I don't, I don't think we turned that computer off for like eight years, and it just had worship on loop. Isn't that right, Ash? It was just all, Planet Shakers, Hillsong. Back in the day, I mean, we had those songs on loop, and our kids knew all the words, whether they liked it or not, because it was all that was playing, so yeah. So don't put pressure on yourself, and honestly, just know that it goes so fast. And every mom that has grown kids can agree with me on that one, I'm sure. Yep. So just enjoy them. Enjoy them. Enjoy the mess. 
Enjoy the busyness. Yeah. Enjoy it. So, and make some good friends. I have <coughs> great friends. I am bats. I mean, Lee used to call me the magic school bus because we would get together all the time. So just find a couple of friends and get together. It makes it so much more yeah. easy and fun. And so. Yeah, yep. that's right. Great answer. Okay, next question. Kim from Portage. Hey, Portage. Uh, with such easy access to media, cell phones, internet, and the way our culture has become over-sensualized, how do I protect my children from being exposed to pornography? That's a great question, and it is one of the great battles of our day uh, with raising kids. So our kids, when they were coming up, uh, cell phones were just kind of on the rise. Texting was kind of the thing. And uh, you didn't have smartphones until they were a little bit older as teenagers. That kind of came on the scene. And I don't remember how old our kids were. It was like 13, I think, before we got them a cell phone. And they were flip phones. I mean, they were like little flip apps. phones. Remember the Motorola Razors? Which, by the way, I still like those phones. They're still sweet, you know, the little flip things. And so they could text, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't necessarily have uh, the internet access on those phones. Uh, a great book I would encourage uh, parents to get is, uh, is number one, is called um, Faith for Exiles, and it's by David Kinnaman. It's talking about raising kids in a digital Babylon, and, uh, and then I think there's another one, uh, Pixelated Parenting, and it's got advice for how to raise your kids in, in this type of environment, because it is a challenge. Just recently saw some statistics that said that an 11-year-old boy in this generation will see 150,000 views of pornography before he's 11 years old. That's on average. The largest market of viewership for pornography online is adolescent boys. It's just insane. When I was growing up, the, the pornography that we were exposed to was if you had a crazy uncle and he had a magazine, or maybe your dad or somebody had it in the house, and you know somebody snuck it out of their house and you left it in the woods or something like that, uh, or maybe you watched a movie on cable or something like that. Today, it's in our hands. And so I think parents, you have to be, uh, you have to be proactive and you have to be in agreement. If you're, if you're a husband and wife, you're married, if you're a single parent and it's just you, you have to be proactive and preemptive in how you are going to approach internet access. Go ahead. And you can't be scared of your kids. No, don't be scared. You know what I mean? Like... They're going to be like, I'm the only one that doesn't get the phone at night and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. it's just like, well, you know, in our yeah. house, this is what we do. And I would, and I know, I mean, I shouldn't say no because we didn't, we weren't there, but um, I would think that we would have had a basket or something. Yeah. Because we Friends never Friends of ours the, do this. Yeah. They have a basket in the kitchen. Uh, and so when you come home, uh, your phone goes in the basket, everybody's. And so, and that's where it stays. If you need to charge it, there's chargers right there. And if you need to check it throughout the evening before you go to bed, you can go and, you know, you can check it and you can respond to texts, you know, right there. But they don't allow their kids to have them on 24-7. They don't allow them to take them to the room. One thing that we did was we never allowed our kids to have computers in the room. They didn't have laptops. And uh, we had one computer for the family that was in our kitchen, open access, that way, if our kids were doing homework, well, they had to do it right there where we could see it. It had internet access. We could see the history. Uh, I would say today, if your kids have iPads and computers, that you need to have their passwords. You need to have accessibility to it. I would put software on there like Covenant Eyes or Triple X or something on there in which you are one of the accountability partners. So uh, if they're gonna try and go around it, uh, they're gonna have to work really, really hard at it and know that you're gonna check up that. And here's what your kids are gonna say. You're invading my privacy, and here's my answer. This house is my privacy. So if you want your own privacy, it's called move out, get your own rent, pay your own bills, eat your own, few, your own food, and you can do that when you're 18 years old. But until that time, you live in my house. This is not a democracy. This is a malevolent dictatorship. I am a beneficent dictator, and yes, I am lording it over you. I am violating all of your civil rights, but I'm paying all the bills. And so I would probably not give my kids smartphones until they're uh, old enough and proven enough 
Uh, here's the thing. You wouldn't give your 14-year-old kid a set of keys to, a, to a, uh, a race car. And the reason why you wouldn't is, number one, they haven't proven that they know how to handle a car. They've not been trained in it. And that amount of horsepower, they could kill themselves. Why are we putting race cars in their hands when they're 13 years old? When they're not trained, they haven't proven themselves, and they have access to things that they can't handle. And so I would be very cautious in doing that. Uh, and parents, you got to get thick skin because your kid. Wait, if you're looking for your kids to like you, then you're, you're going to live your life uh, stressed out and full of anxiety, and your kids are going to run right over you. You just have to have a long game vision. It's like my kids are going to like me someday. <laughs> someday. Someday we can be friends, and someday you'll understand all of my decisions. When your frontal lobe is fully developed, and, you, and boys, you, don't have, you have enough testosterone flowing through your teenage body to knock out a horse. And so you're not making rational decisions. Your frontal lobe is not fully developed, so I'm going to make them for you. I'll make those decisions for you. And uh, I think w as parents, we got to get over that. You... Yep. And I think that as parents, and even... Christian parents or whatever, that we need to be more, um, like, on the know of what is going on, because yeah. there's so many apps that they, like, disguise, you know, like, I saw yeah. something that, like, a calculator that they can download really isn't yeah. a calculator, it's some, I mean, it's just crazy, and I think that sometimes we're like, oh, da, 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 da. Yeah. but I mean, to really yeah. dig in and figure out what is on their phone, what they're looking at, and yeah. all that, and just not be like, trust them, or yeah. think it is what, what, what it was yeah. even five years ago. I feel like it's yeah. changed so much, and just be proactive in that and really investigate. Yeah. I feel like it's our job as parents to, to do know. that, even as tiring as it may be, and it might be easier to be like, I don't want to, but it can open up so many doors yeah. that... Um, Children are our greatest know. investment. And so we need to be educated in the things that we're investing into. And so we need to be, uh, we need to be students of culture. Uh, the apps that she's talking about, we read some articles on that where there's actually apps that have been developed that look like calculator, the calculator app on your smartphone that you can download so that if, they, if your parents scroll through your phone and they see a calculator, they'll leave it alone. But if you click it, it's actually a like a WhatsApp chat thing or it's an online chat room where it, it's basically a sexting environment. And so parents, the only way that you're going to know that stuff is if you're studying what's going on, you're utilizing Focus on the Family, fa Family Research Committee, you're reading books. If children and families are really our number one investment, then think about how much you study before you invest your money into retirement and 401ks or in mutual funds. You need to study that much to be a parent and to be a husband or a wife, okay? Um, thanks for the claps. That was awesome. Okay. <laughs> this is Sarah online. Is it okay to read trashy novels or watch movies to enhance your marital sex life? You can answer that one. I'm not answering that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jane and I have read all of the Fifty Shades of Grey together. No. We have not. Um, the fact that you describe them as trashy uh, and that you're talking about enhancing your marital sex life with things that you describe as trashy, let me just say that th that, that speaks to a underlying deficit that's already there. And no, you don't need to compromise your moral values in order to enhance your sexual life within your marriage. The key is maybe resolve some issues that are underlying in your marriage because when there's intimacy, you don't have to, if the only way we can have a healthy sex life and a satisfying sex life is if we receive an infusion of the world's twisted and perverted view of sexuality, then what we're saying to God is what you created isn't enough. And the reality is our own brokenness is actually the deficit, and Jesus offers healing for that. And I, whoever, Sarah, online, thank you for asking that, and thank you for your vulnerability. But I would just say, look, uh, that's a deep rabbit hole. You continue to go down the world's way, and, you, and then it's going to take something else, and then it's going to take something else, and then it's going to take something else, and you will never find satisfaction. 
Satisfaction is found in true intimacy where you can be vulnerable, you are committed to one another, and you kind of learn from one another. And uh, I thought maybe you were gonna jump in here. Not yet, huh? Okay. <laughs> I keep waiting on you. Go ahead, jump, jump, jump. Uh, <clears throat> and so I would say, no, you don't need that. In fact, I think it's actually detrimental. Because uh, uh, let, me, let me say this. For a man, men are visually stimulated. Okay, so that's where pornography comes in for the most part. Men are attracted to pornography because they see something and it turns them on. For, for most women, this is a generality, but the way that women are wired, it's more emotional. And so reading uh, a Harlequin romance or Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever does something to a woman's emotions that is similar to what visual pornography does to a man. And so sometimes a trashy novel is just as detrimental for a woman as pornography is to a man. And so it's emotional pornography. So a lot of times we're just like, well, he's dirty, he's watching porn as we're reading these trashy novels off the bookshelves about, you know, I can't believe it's not Buddha or whoever that guy is, you know, <laughs> Fabio with the long flowing hair, sweeps her off the feet, and it's like, it's creating a fantasy that's not reality. And then your husband comes home, and instead of a six-pack, he's got a six-gallon. <laughs> and he doesn't have long, flowing, you know, blonde hair because he's been at the gym. He comes home in a nasty Carhartt jacket, and you're just like, you're not what I read about. It's like, no, he needs to become your fantasy, not Flavio, okay? <laughs> so there we go. Anyways, next question. Not, not ready to jump in. Okay, so... Sean, is it okay to get divorced if your spouse identifies as LGBT after marriage? Uh, wow, that's a big question. Uh, so what I would need to know is this. So when, they say, when they're identifying as LGBT, so if you're unfamiliar with what that means, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and, and that's a wide range, okay, uh, of descriptions in four letters. But if you're saying to me that after marriage, the person that you're married to, in their transparency and vulnerability with you, honestly say that they struggle in temptation in those arenas, uh, then that's, that's an issue that you, you guys can work on and you can get some help and there can be healing and you can still have a very healthy and successful marriage because there's transparency and there's honesty and, and obviously there's an attraction that took place. But if you're saying that after marriage, they're saying, I made a mistake in marrying you because I'm something else, and I want to pursue that. If that person, if that individual is unwilling to repent, and I'm assuming that there's two believers here. If there's not, uh, then that's, that's a different situation. If you're a believer and your spouse is an unbeliever and they identify as LGBT and say, I don't wanna be married to you, and they abandon that marriage, yes, you can get remarried. Uh, you can get divorced, and it may not be your desire, but if they abandon the marriage, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you're free. But if we're talking about two believers, then we ought to have more faith in the ability of God to transform and change us and heal that which he has put together. He said, let no man divide. Matthew chapter 19, Genesis chapter 2. What God has brought together, let no man bring or divide asunder. He's able to transform and he's able to heal if there's transparency and there's honesty. Now, if what you're saying is that after we got married, my partner began to act out on their LGBT desires and then they've informed me without repentance of the partner who's participating in that, you absolutely have grounds for divorce because that's sexual immorality. And that would be true if it wasn't lesbian, gay, or bisexual or transgenderism. That would be equally true if you had a partner that was having sex outside of their marriage and their relationship with you with a heterosexual individual. It still falls under the category of sexual immorality. And when that is unrepentant, when not repented of, and you've done all that you can to bring restoration, you absolutely have biblical grounds to divorce them and then be free in the Lord to move on. And uh, I, I'm not sure of what's going on uh, for Sean, but uh, Sean, I just want you to know we're praying for you. We pray for healing. If this is a real life situation, we pray that God will bring healing, will bring clarity, will bring truth to that situation so that that marriage can make it. Anything you want to add to that? Okay. Uh, next question. Rick, online, 
Why was polygamy and multiple concubines allowed in the Old Testament, and yet God says marriage is between one man and one woman? Why and when did this design seem to change? That's an awesome question. Uh, It's interesting to me, by the way, I don't know if anybody saw this, but the state of Utah just decriminalized polygamy last week. So it is no longer a criminal offense in the state of Utah, which has a huge Mormon majority. And the Mormon church, if you study the history of the Church of Latter-day Saints uh, that was founded by Joseph Smith and, and then followed up by Brigham Young, they taught polygamy. And actually, many of them, even to this day, continue to practice that different sex in, uh, in Utah. And so they've just decriminalized it. So uh, here's the answer. The Bible records some things that are descriptive and some things that are prescriptive. In other words, uh, when the Bible tells you to love your neighbor, that is prescriptive. God's telling you what to do. Some things that you read in the Bible that people did are just being described. God's not putting his seal of approval on it. And so nowhere in the Bible will you see that God commands or condones polygamy or multiple concubines. In fact, almost every time that you see it in the Bible, whether it's Abraham, whether it's David, whether it's Solomon, these guys who did it because it was very po- it was very common in those cultures at that particular time, they were actually adapting to culture. They were not staying within the confines of covenant with God. And almost every single time that they did it, there was controversy, there were problems, and there was sin that emerged out of it. You will never see blessing that comes out of those things. And so when you see that, it's, pres- it's uh, descriptive. What is God prescribed? Genesis chapter two, before the fall, it says that, a man, and a, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And let no man divide what God has brought together. That, in Matthew chapter nine, 19, Jesus said, from the very beginning, he created them male and female and brought them together. One man, one woman, in the bonds of marriage in the sight of God. That was God's prescription for marriage. Then what we see is a lot of people who make a lot of mistakes and jack things up along the way and... Uh, all the, all the stuff that we see right now going on in the Middle East, it's because of adultery and polygamy. The battles between uh, uh, Arab, Muslims, and Jewish people, and even Christians in the Middle East, is all the result of Ishmael and, uh, Ishmael and, and his descendants that were, go all the way back to Abraham, who, when his wife said, oh, I can't have children, because she didn't have the patience to wait for God to fulfill his word, brought her servant in to Abraham, and Abraham didn't have enough ethics or integrity to say, no, I'm not gonna do that. So he did it, and then an Ishmael was born out of that. And the descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs, and there's been contention ever since in the Middle East. So if you want that to be your legacy, go ahead, move to Utah, and, uh, and have a polygamous marriage if you want to. That's what you have to look forward to. But if we do it God's way, we receive God's blessing. And uh, unfortunately, concubines, uh, that means they're unmarried sex slaves, basically, or sex partners. I want you to think about this. Uh, Solomon had hundreds of them. He had hundreds of wives, which I don't know for the life of me how he made it through. (laughs) The Bible says he was one of the wisest men who ever lived. That was dumb. (laughs) Can you imagine his marriage counseling bill? I mean, and then he had concubines by the hundreds as well. If you look at the life, the lineage of how sin compounds from generation to generation in the same way that blessing compounds, think about this. Psalm 51, David describes himself as, I was conceived in sin. Many scholars believe that David was the kid out in the back 40 because he was actually a child from an adulterous relationship that his father Jesse had. So Jesse has an adulterous relationship, gives birth to David. David marries multiple women and commits adultery with Bathsheba. He gives birth to Solomon. He also gives birth to Absalom, and he also gives birth to Tamar. Uh, And so there's incest that comes as a result of that. And then Solomon has multiple wives and hundreds of concubines. And what does he do? He builds temples next to God's temple for the worship of false gods. And he ends up writing Ecclesiastes, and at the end of his life, he says, vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. 
In other words, it's all emptiness. And then Solomon's son becomes the king, and Israel and Judah are divided. So it goes from Jesse 1 to multiple generations and even nations that are divided three generations later. That's what concubines and polygamy creates. Now, if we do it God's way, uh, then we can expect his blessing, not, not just to one generation, he says, but to those who honor his word. In Deuteronomy 27, he says, to those who honor his word, his blessing goes down to a thousand generations. How many want a thousand generation blessing on your family? Then stay married, do it God's way. There you go. Uh, okay, we did it, Jane. Anything you want to say before we pray? Yep. Say bye to everybody. <laughs> Let's all stand up together. Would you stand with me? Lord, we love you and we're so grateful for your faithfulness to us. We're so grateful that you've given us the privilege of building families and entering into the covenant of marriage, which is the only institution on the face of the earth that you said mirrors your relationship with the church. It's Christ and his bride. Lord, what a privilege, what a joy. And I, and tonight, we just pray for marriages. We pray for families. We pray for those who want to be married. We pray for those who are in marriages that are struggling. Lord, and we pray for those who are building legacies in their marriage. We pray for kids and households and families. Lord, we pray, have your way. Lord, bring healing where there needs to be healing. I pray, let there be strength where things are weak. Lord, I pray for those who are on this journey of building families and it's all brand new to them. Lord, that they would build a household of faith on your word, in your house, loving Jesus with all their heart, loving one another, and enjoying the gift of life together. And Lord, we pray for change in those who are experiencing brokenness right now, those who are praying for spouses that do not serve the Lord. We pray that there would be breakthrough those who are praying for kids who are prodigals, Lord, we just stand with them and we say, Lord, we've trained them up in the way that they should go and we declare that when they are old, they shall not depart from the faith, but they shall be planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish and they shall be fruitful all the days of their lives. God, we're just so grateful that you've called us into your family and that you've given us your word as a grid and a foundation and a blueprint to build our lives on. I want to invite our prayer partners to, and our prayer ministry teams at both campuses to move into place down at the front if they would. Uh, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed all over the room, I, uh, before we close and dismiss, I, I know that whenever we ask questions or we answer questions like what we've had answered tonight, sometimes it's, it's very close to what we're going through or sometimes just a question has a way of awakening pain, fear, or a situation that we need God to break through in. You know, sometimes we think about Red Hot as these questions are gonna be hot. But really, the whole goal of Red Hot is that our faith in Jesus and our pursuit of God would actually be hot. It would be, we would be on fire in our trust of God. And tonight, if you feel like maybe your faith has grown lukewarm at best, and you want that flame to be fanned again and become red hot, then tonight we're just gonna invite you in a moment to come and receive prayer and just say, to come to one of the prayer partners and just say, I, I, want, I want my faith to come alive again. You might be here and just in the middle of a, a battle, in the middle of a situation in your family, your marriage, or a dating relationship, or whatever it is, and you're just like, I need God to break through, I need a miracle. We're gonna invite you to come in just a moment and receive prayer. You might be somebody you're sitting back and, and coming to, coming to uh, a realization that there's things on the inside of you that you need to repent, you need to change, you need to invite Jesus to become Lord of that area of your life. I wanna challenge you tonight. Don't pack it up and take it with you. Surrender it to Jesus. Let, let that... Let that faucet get opened into your life of God's blessing once again. Let the flow of his divine favor have flow in your life again. Lord, tonight, as we dismiss, we thank you for your goodness, 
your grace and your mercy. Send us from this place full of joy, full of peace, knowing that we belong to you. And meet us down front, Lord, as prayer happens. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Break off chains, open eyes, heal hearts, restore hope, bring forgiveness, save to the uttermost, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.